Hey, it's Bill Simmons from The Ringer, and this is a podcast called The Rewatchables. We have been doing it really since 2017. It started with how much we love the movie Heat. We decided to structure a whole podcast with categories, most rewatchable scene, who won the movie, Apex Mountain, what age the best. But here's the thing. If you want the full archive, you can hear them only on Spotify for free, by the way. So make sure to follow The Rewatchables on Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. Welcome back to another episode of the Ringers NBA Draft Show. My name is Kevin O'Connor, and joining me once again is the Ringers, J. Kyle Mann. How are you doing today, man? How's everything going, with all things considered? Doing fine, you know. Get it. It's uh, one day at a time. I, I was telling you before we started the show, you know, if it had been any other time of year, I probably would have been a little quieter about all that stuff. But I, I wanted to let people know I was very encouraged by, and like, it was, it was just nice to talk to people and relate. You never know how many people are going through things, and uh, and I appreciated people reaching out. But yeah, just kind of, you know, inching back towards normalcy and and being reflective and all that stuff. Not to start the show off, right? But I know people were kind of <laughs> wondering. But you know, I was going to say I had uh, I so it wasn't a normal year, obviously. So on draft night, I was like, Megan was like, you should just watch it and just enjoy it. She was like, don't worry about working. So all right, I was like, I'm going to go to my favorite like little Mexican place. I had my little notebook with me. You know, I was making notes as the draft was going on. But I got this, I got like a Dos Equis beer and I picked it up and the moment, and this was a big beer. And the moment I picked it up, the bottom of it dropped out, like the glass broke, like the bottom third of the glass. So 32 ounces of beer went all <laughs> over my clothes. It got my notebooks soaking wet. And I stood up in this crowded restaurant and turned around and, and just was like the subject of, uh, I don't know, laughter for a moment. I, it was pretty funny. I would have laughed. I was just like, <laughs> what? Come on, universe. What the hell? So. But anyway, I, yeah, I enjoyed the draft. I in any circumstance, I do. Uh, but there's a lot to catch up on, Kev, and I'm excited to get into it with you. Did you get a new beer? <laughs> yes. I mean, it was like, I don't know. That's that's a that's just an uncomfortable thing to be soaked with. I guess it's not quite as bad as like soda or you know Stinky. water, obviously. But uh, <laughs> I just kind of sat there in in my embarrassment and 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 wrote it out. <laughs> it was, you go, uh, you go, you go home. She says, "How many beers did you have? You really stink." <laughs> <laughs> Megan was like, good Lord, did you did you bathe in beer? I got beer all over, my, <laughs> all over my thinking basketball hoodie. So sorry to Ben Taylor for that one. But uh, yeah, I was I was repping the brand soaked in beer out there in, in Louisville. It was it was a great look, Kev. Well, it's good to have you back this week, Kyle. The draft was last Thursday. Last week, we had the great Danny Chow back first ringer pod back on the show. We'll have to do a pod with the three of us at some point. And uh, let's catch up on what we haven't hit. With the draft, you are on one shining podcast this week with Tate Frazier. You guys talked about the Hornets, what they did alongside Brandon Miller. You raved about Jaime Jaquez. You talked about the Jazz, the Thunder, the Sixers, and the BS pod last week. Tate and I talked also about the Jazz and the Thunder as winners. We talked about Cam Whitmore falling in the draft. And then on the mismatch, we talked about the Nuggets and how much we liked the picket selection in the second round. We talked I about the Jazz, that. the Heat. I mean, we love that Jalen Pickett. You know, it's perfect for them. It's perfect. It really is. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, there's no, there could not be a better fit for him. We talked about the Warriors p with Pajimski getting Trace Jackson Davis. I'm sh shocked he fell as far as he did. But today, let's kind of fill the gaps and talk about a lot of the stuff that we haven't talked about on our pods that we haven't heard a lot of other people focus on. And I, I want to start off, Kyle, with the Pistons. They took Osar Thompson. 
with the fifth pick in the draft, right after his brother Amen Thompson, his twin brother, with the fourth pick to the Rockets. We talked pre-draft all season long about the importance of fit for both the Thompson twins. I think with Osar in this situation, they also take Marcus Sasser with the 25th pick. They traded up for him. What P- Detroit's doing with Cade Cunningham and Jaden Ivey, Marcus Sasser, Osar Thompson, I feel like Osar has landed in the perfect situation here for him to focus on all of his strengths and wiles and still have the possibility to blossom as an on-ball guy as well. Do you feel similar to me about that? Yeah, I was going to ask you about... Uh, I do I do feel simil- similarly. Uh, I was going to ask you, I mean, on that night, did you kind of come away from it feeling like they massacred, massacred your boy a little bit, that like Killian was sort of not a part of the thinking, it didn't seem like, in terms of adding Sasser? I mean, Sasser seems like he's going to be a solid rotation. I feel like he'll be a solid rotation guy early on, for especially for that team and where they are. Um I don't know how I was before we get to that. Do you, how do you think that affects the, the Killian equation here in terms of their plans going forward? I would say for Detroit, Killian is now unimportant. So let's move on to the important pieces. <laughs> I think Killian is going to have to find a new home. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, uh, there was a quote by Troy Weaver about Marcus Sasser where he said, you know, about why did you guys trade up from 31 to 25 with two future seconds? And he said something along the lines of, you know, when, you, when you're building what we're trying to do, you need rocks. This Sasser's a rock. He, he's steady. He's a stabilizer. You know, we need personalities like that as we, you know, rebuild this situation. So we, we put our assets in and we went out there and we got them. So clearly they highly value Marcus Sasser. Um, I, I would expect unless they want, you know, a ton of ball handlers on their roster and want to have a lot of smallish lineups. I would think for Killian, he's going to be used more of as a trade chip for a team that still has some level of belief in him to say, hey, you know what? We'll take a shot and see if he can turn into something. Whereas for Detroit, you know, I mean, they got Cade, they got Ivy, they got Sasser, and now they have Osar Thompson, who is, you know, not going to necessarily be the primary guy alongside Cade Cunningham, but he's going to have opportunities in that multi ball handler offense that they're building out to be somebody who is an important fixture on that team. Yeah, I, I think they just probably couldn't stomach. You know, in theory, hypothetically, Killian is an idea that is enticing to have as like, a you know, a tertiary kind of ball handler. But I just don't think, I don't think that they could withstand the variance that comes with him, which is, you know, the spotty shooting, the erratic decision making, the things, the defensive stuff. I mean, I, I think that, Asar gives you more size, you know, I don't even like shooting wise, uh, he could he could end up becoming a better shooter than than Killian. It's possible this past season, 35.8 on catch and shoot, 37.7 percent on catch and shoot when he didn't take a dribble. So um, he's a guy that could develop. We've talked a lot about his shooting evolution. And I think when you look at Detroit, um, I was just kind of looking at their roster. and I was like, OK, what's what's the you, you're we talked a lot about before the draft about like sort of that going from zero to one, going from uh, going from void of form to something that makes sense, which is really difficult to do in the NBA if you're trying to go from the ground up. And I was trying to say like, OK, well, what what makes the most sense for them? The Cade Ivy and I'm going to say Duran, I'm going to include him in there as well. That trio, I think, makes sense if you're kind of looking at the, the core of it. You know, Bogdanovich, who knows? We can talk more about that, like the, the, the stuff that maybe won't be there in the future, Alec Burks, things like that, that they could use to sort of move forward. Um, but Asar, I think you look at that and you, you say, OK, well, you need some perimeter size with that group. You need some switchability. Uh, eventually, I think they're going to need some more rim protection. So I, but I think that they got the size and the switchability. I think that he's going to be able to attack the basket and transition. He'll be a fun toy for Cade. I know we always say that with playmakers. Um, they're bigger. They're, they're more athletic. Um, I think Osar was a good bet there. And I, I think and Sasser as sort of a, a stabilizer makes a lot of sense. I, I like what Detroit did. I'm not like leveled by it. You know, I, they didn't get the like huge swing that they wanted. You know, they wanted Brandon Miller. I don't know that they you don't think they scoot. got the huge swing. You don't think Osar's a huge swing. I mean, I look at Osar and I'm in and I'm like, you know, these guys are like Anthony Black with Zion's athleticism. And like if if they're gonna these both of them I think have the chance if Wemby has a, has you know durability issues throughout his career I think both the Thompson twins have an opportunity to be the best player from this draft class uh, I see their upside is that significant it, it is, all I, works out 
Yeah, it is. It, uh, the range of where they could, the range of outcomes is a little wider, I think. I think the floor for what Scoot and Miller are is higher, though. I think that's what I would say. Whether or not they end up at those higher outcomes is possible. I, really, what I mean with the swing is just like they probably wanted to get Miller. I, in my opinion, I mean, if you if you if it came down to it, maybe internally, I don't know if you know something I don't that maybe they valued Osarama in a, a, ahead of him, but uh, that's mainly where I'm going with that. But I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it just they're going to be bad again next year. I don't know what what do you think their win total is even going to be next year? Thirties? Do you think what's the probability that they move into that like Orlando Magic kind of? I don't know. I'm not even ready to get there because there's the reports about the, how they could be a team that pursues Draymond Green. They could go after Cam Johnson. We, we just don't know what their roster is going to look like. Um, so I, I think what, it, that also depends on how much does Cade Cunningham get better. You know, Cade, you know, aside from his freshman year in college, he hasn't shot threes well throughout his, you know, life in basketball in high school or in the NBA. He's throughout his career in the NBA, 30.9% from three. He's been a very good mid-range shooter. Um, is his touch finally going to translate from near the basket and the free throw line where he's 84% in his career and has been 80 plus percent for a long time? Will that finally translate to, you know, three point range? Will, you know, Jaden Ivey continue ascending from, you know, the progress he made at the end of the season? What other moves do they actually make? You mentioned Bogdanovich. Will they go after Cam Johnson? Will he? Will the Nets match an offer sheet for him? Will they be the team that goes after Draymond alongside Portland? And you know, Golden State still hopes to resign him. Detroit. I mean, they're in an interesting position. I, I I might be, you know, twisting his words a little too much here, but I do I do recall you know Troy Weaver saying at some point like they do want to take steps forward. This mm-hmm. coming season, so you know they win, <laughs> they win seventeen games last year. Uh, steps forward could be winning twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty games, yeah. right? So uh, I think for Portland, depending on who they get, will determine what level they reach. With that Marcus Sasser pick, are you surprised they did move up six spots for him? You know, considering you know his age, you know, I wonder who in that range could have actually taken him. Uh, between you know twenty six and thirty, who they were actually nervous about throughout that stretch, because it's a lot of teams there that already have guards. I don't know. Maybe they're just being extra safe, and they see Sasser as an upside you know piece, like he said, a rock. Do you see Marcus Sasser as a fit for that Detroit core as well? Yeah, I think if you extend the rotation, I don't know how much of like a capable starter he's going to be, but I mean, uh, he definitely is somebody that can be a competent rotation guy, kind of in the way Six that. Man. Like, yeah, if, you know, there's a lot of minutes to go around. You can't downplay. There's, you know, not the starters aren't going to play the full run there. You need that kind of stability throughout your throughout your rotation. I mean, Sasser, you know, he's a dribble pull-up shooter. I don't know that his, like, ceiling is as high in terms of, like, you know, where he could go. But uh, we've seen some of these guys. I mean, like, Tyus Jones is a guy who grew into a valuable commodity, a player who was, you know, younger, came out of college younger. Um, Sasser, I think... I think he, Troy Weaver hit it. Obviously, he knows his team well. Uh, he didn't need me to affirm that. But, I mean, he, for this young team, I think that Sasser is a nice middle ground between youth and he is a little bit, he's going to be a little bit older as a rookie. Um, I, I think that he's a nice counterbalance for their, like, second unit as they try to develop some of those guys. I like, I do. I'm with you there, absolutely. Uh, you know, so we have Amen, fourth pick to Houston, Osar, fifth pick to Detroit, and then the sixth pick, was Anthony Black going to the Orlando Magic. Um, You know, on Bill Simmons' podcast last week, me and Tate talked about how, you know, in theory, this makes sense. You know, adding a big ball handling presence. We see the value of Markel Fultz with what he's done even as a non-three-point shooter within that Magic offense. But, you know, you know, obviously they get Jed Howard, you know, with the 11th pick, but Orlando, they, they get a stinky three-point shooting core. I mean, they don't shoot three as well. Even they're, they're some of their best young prospects. I love Ben Caro. I love Franz Wagner. These guys thus far in their careers have been average or worse from three-point range. And now they add a guy in black who theoretically improved his shot throughout you know, the, since the college season ended, but he's never been a good shooter. And there's always questions with those guys. I'm a bit iffy on this fit. It's an upside selection if he figures it out. Um, but I, I, I kind of wish he landed on a team, you know, where where that wouldn't matter as much for him. It's very important that he develop it with Orlando. Do you think there was a better, like, a team out there that was in more and had more need for a connector like him that could maybe withstand some of the shooting? Is there one off the top of your head that you had pegged as 
as a better fit for him? Uh, I mean, I think like a clean slate like Washington. Indiana is kind of a connective piece next to Halliburton. Granted, they already have Matherin and some other guards and wings there. Um, you, we talked Utah, about that all year. Maybe. Yeah. Indiana, we we kind of had pegged Amen as a fun one. Would have been fun there. Yes. Black does similar things. You know, they're they're similar. It's just he's not as, as athletic. Yeah, some something along those lines. Yeah, I was more curious about your reaction to the Jed Howard thing. I mean, I was surprised to see him go that high. I mean, a lot of the you could kind of feel the consensus sort of like shifting like a like a weather like pressure system <laughs> away from Jed Howard over the course of the year. I wasn't as like troubled by it. I mean, you got to kind of wonder. I know we're going to talk about the Raptors. It makes you wonder why maybe they didn't go for Grady Dick there. Because, I mean, Grady Dick is a more consistent shooter. He gives you the same kind of size. I mean, Howard has a little more of a self-creation upside. I don't know. I, I, that that one was kind of curious. I was curious if you were sort of repulsed by them reaching for for Howard there. Well, I thought it would be Grady Dick with the 11th pick. Dick's been a better shooter uh, than Howard. Howard, uh, you know, like you said, he has a bit more creation flashes. Uh, within that Michigan offense, there was more opportunities to show off his movement off ball and whatnot than, than Dick did at times with Kansas. Um I don't know. I think they made the wrong choice, personally. I would have went with Grady Dick over Jet Howard. It's just a personal preference thing between those two. Maybe you could argue Jet Howard, you know, athletically, you know, he has, you know, better size, better length than Grady Dick. But it's not like Grady Dick is like a poor athlete. He's a really good athlete. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for Orlando, um, I don't know. I mean, I I don't love the pick. I personally don't. I, I think there's some risk there. But the one thing I will say in their favor is that some of his, you know, shortcomings are overcome. It's kind of the opposite of Anthony Black. You know, all that length on defense can overcome if he's not a great defensive player. And that was still, you know, the concern with Grady Dick as well, where these guys both hustle, they try hard. So I think they have that going for them where they're they're, they're never going to be liabilities. But it'd be nice if, you know, they could have found a stopper there. And maybe that's what they envisioned with Anthony Black. And that's why they took him there. Um, I just don't think either of them were perfect fits. Whereas for Grady Dick, you know, landing with the Toronto Raptors, I think that's a great fit. Landing with all their guys, you know, Scotty Barnes, rubbing dribble handoffs, uh, Pascal Siakam, if they keep him, you know, moving forward. OG and Anobi, I think Dick really fits right into that core (laughs) <laughs> I didn't mean to do it's that. Just, but the, I did not mean to do that. It's just inevitable. <laughs> it's just inevitable. He, it he, just is. He slides right in oh, to that Jesus Raptors Christ. core. <laughs> God. I said he, lean away dirty from mind. <laughs> I'm not even being dirty. You're sitting there talking about Dick sliding in. What am I supposed to? Come on. That's not even. I'm not being imaginative here. All right. Sorry. Sorry, everyone in the car with your kids. We're going to get over this quickly it's kind of like it's not on the same level but it's like me my whole life i've heard every man joke like, hey what's up man you know i'm just like okay cool we'll move on dick's on another level though it's just kind of <laughs> it's another <laughs> level i feel you know you i'm see, sure he's you, tired of it or you see the video it. of his, the donald duck impression he does no i heard it was good oh, though it's really good yeah it's very <laughs> funny you don't get a lot of impressions like from from draft picks i don't think i've heard that one i mean uh I don't know. I've heard rookies be forced to impress impersonate players. Uh, there's a really funny video of the Rockets rookies back in like 2008 impersonating Dikembe Mutombo, and it's pretty wonderful. I encourage people to look that up. Anyway, Grady Dick. Yes, good fit. I was going to say with o- Orlando, yeah, it's they're a team that like they they had to add movement shooting. They had to. You know, they have they have the physical downhill stuff. They have the over the top passing. Like Franz is a guy. If somebody drops. You know, he can hit a three if he has space, but they just don't have guys that shoot well with movement. I thought that Jordan Hawkins would have been interesting for them. I think if they had a chance to go out there and maybe potentially get Seth Curry, uh, that's a guy that I've been pushing for them that I think would fit perfectly with Orlando. Um, They sort of addressed it. We'll see if Jed Howard, the creation thing, I think, is probably the swing thing. Like you're like, okay, this guy can movement shoot. And then he has this whole other avenue that he could grow. And he's and he's big. He's like he's six eight. I never got a confirmation. He didn't measure at the combine, um, but he's listed at six eight. And it also makes you wonder, Kevin, how is Michigan so bad if they had two first round picks and Hunter Dickinson who is so good? I w- I just kept replaying that in my mind. I was like, did that team just not get along? What was going on with Michigan? I don't know. Yeah, I know. It's it is strange how that how poor that team was considering all the talent on him. And you mentioned Kobe Buffkin going to Atlanta. 
I'm fascinated by that choice that they made because Quinn Snyder and some of the Hawks players, you know, at the end of the last season have talked about some of the motion concepts that he's installing. And Trey Young's been such a stationary player throughout his career. You know, even though back in college at Oklahoma, he did show off some movement skills using, using screens. There's been little little flashes of it in the NBA. You draft Kobe Bufkin, who's very good at movement, very high IQ player. He knows how to move without the ball. He's a great cutter. He's awesome at finishing off of cuts to the basket. You know, he shows an improved shot a sophomore year. You draft him. I think that indicates that these these are the Hawks' true intentions, that Snyder wants to build a system that emphasizes movement. So I, I'm going to be, you know, so interested to see if Trey Young does fully embrace that next season and becomes a player that maintains his value on offense even when the ball is in his, in his hands. Because I think he has it in him. I really do. I believe in Trey. You know, when I say it all the time, people think it's, you know, criticism. No, it's it's a compliment to him to believe that he can. And I, I, I think Buffkin could be an indication that, that that's the direction that they want to go. Yeah, he fits that mold of what they've tried to do with Trey throughout. I mean, yeah, Buffkin is a guy who just kind of gives you the triumvirate, the, the, the trinity, the pass, dribble, shoot thing, which is, you know, multiple handlers. We saw OKC is leaning all the way into that philosophy with their, with their, uh, <laughs> uh, cause, I keep messing it up. Kaysen, Kasson, Kaysen, Kaysen. As a Kentucky person, I've called him Kaysen for so long that my brain is going to have to totally rewire. Uh, no, but I mean, just multiple handlers. I've, I've said that on this show over and over again. You can't have enough in the spaced out game. It makes sense. Maybe it gives you a little bit of insurance later on if he develops. He's not nearly as big, obviously, as Bogey, but uh, Bogey's like 6'6", six, six, right? I've, I'm trying to remember. He's not quite as big as Bogey, but uh, yeah, gives you, gives you another handler for your timeline in case some of those guys move on. Makes sense. It's never a bad idea to draft a guy like that. Let's talk about some good fits bad fits uh, are, are there any teams that you know that we haven't talked about kyle uh that you think stand out as bad fits across the league with what you saw my mind kind of just came back to there there are several guys i think that are just like timeline fit issues you know because if talent is there you want to take it obviously especially if you're not close you know um because a lot of the, a lot of the the good teams, I think, did pretty well drafting guys that fit with them. We talked about Miami taking Hawkes makes sense. We talked about uh, you know the Clippers taking the older guys. I loved those picks. Uh, I think that like you know I think Jordan Walsh is going to fit in great with Boston. Uh, there's no pressure on him. There's some guys though that I wonder if they're going to have the developmental runway. Like for the Rockets, it made sense. Whitmore is there. Like I said you don't have something that you're sure about, reach for the talent there. I kind of wonder if he's going to end up getting reddished, like Cam reddished on this roster because mm. of the amount of like guys that they have. Because if you think of the Atari, I'm in, Jabari, Kenyon Martin Jr., I, I kind of wonder if he may end up being a guy that doesn't totally fit into the plan and ends up kind of becoming like a distressed asset that someone else takes. I know I'm looking way down the road That's here. That's a but, good one. That, yeah. uh, I hadn't thought about it in like the Cam reddish sense with Houston for Cam Whitmore, where it's like, you know, it's a, it's a good fit in the sense that they're a, they're a young team and they, they can, they're willing to bet on his upside and give him opportunities, but it can be a bad fit in the sense that you're going to have Amen, you know, as the lead ball handler of that team. Jalen Green's going to get a ton of touches. You mentioned Tari Eason, the front court, Al Perrin, Shengun, DHOs, he gets touches. For Cam Whitmore, it, it really might be a lot of just, hey, stand in the corner and you're not doing much of anything, dude. That's a, that's a group of erratic shooters, dude. And you think about like Whitmore being in there, it just kind of makes you wonder if something is going to shake out and not be this way. You know, it's not going to stay this way for, for long, in my opinion. Um, but it, it may be a thing where Whitmore just kind of the beginning of his career plays out like this. I know I'm, I'm really reading into this and predicting a lot, but uh, it could be a thing where he, he takes a minute to find a home, even if, if whether it's in Houston or not. He may, he may hit in Houston, but I, I just look at that cluster of players. And I'm like, I just, I'm kind of unsure about that. Did you have another bad fit that you were, that you eyeballed or zeroed in on? Yeah, the, the, it's two players on one team. It's Andre Jackson Jr. and Chris Livingston both go into the Bucks. And I, I like Andre Jackson Jr. a lot. I love him as a prospect. But for Milwaukee, you know, he's, 
you know, 29% from three in his career at UConn. Chris Livingston, even though, you know, reports say, you know, and sources say both, you know, that he shot well in pre-draft workouts, he did shoot only 30% from three at Kentucky as you watched him brick all year long. So I think for Milwaukee, a team that they're in a situation where Chris Middleton's a free agent, he's expected to come back. Brooke Lopez is a free agent we don't know. Seems like there could be some interest out there with him. Maybe he gets significantly outbid. For the Bucks. considering the way Budenholzer's system was, I don't like the fit for Livingston or for Jackson. Now, maybe it's dramatically different under their new head coach, Adrian Griffin, and, and, and you know things will make sense there. But considering Giannis's shooting deficiencies, Considering, you know, even with Brooke as mu- as good as he is, he's still, so, you know, 35 or lower percent from three throughout his, you know, in recent years with Milwaukee. It's not like he's a 40 plus percent guy. I, I, I just don't feel great about adding two non shooters into that equation. I mean, Andre Jackson was getting ignored. I know UConn won the title, but he was getting the Andre Robertson, Tony Allen treatment just blatantly ignored. I don't know. I, I, it's, it's a lot of, lot of questions on my mind about that Bucks fit with considering the implications for them to be finals contenders. I, I don't know. You've loved uh, Jackson throughout the year, too. I mean, I, I feel I like that's so that's really, you know, that's interesting. I feel like connectivity has been like one of the big like bu- draft buzz words in the past calendar year. Like, I feel it, it always was talked about, but I just feel like it's become more of a thing. And I mean, it's a good word. It it works for you know a lot of players and for him is that connectivity going to matter as much on the Bucks? I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, I guess it just kind of speaks to this idea that you make good decisions whether or not you have the ball in your hands for a long time. And I think he fits that bill, you know. And if you think about Milwaukee, there, I I said this last year with Keegan, it was just like the touches are spoken for. Like Andre needs to be, you need somebody on a good team like this that A, doesn't need to, like, come along as a decision maker. We saw him exist within that offense um, as a great connector. We saw him, like, save botch plays. We saw him, like, make quick touch passes. We saw him, over the course of the tournament, he evolved within the course of the tournament into a guy who was, like, you were talking about him getting the Robertson, you know, and credit to Dan Hurley for doing this. They sort of evolved him into a guy who, like, you couldn't you couldn't penalize UConn for for him as a, as a non shooter because they turned him into like a dribble handoff guy almost in the Draymond sense. Yep. I think that him being on that team implies that he maybe would be playing with a shooter at the five. You know, I don't I don't have in front of me how much Portis played the five this past year. I'm gonna say probably not much. Uh, and then you got to say like you know maybe he plays with Brook Lopez depending on you know whether Giannis is resting that. But I think he he is the level of decision maker. Agree or disagree here? I, I think that like. He is the level of decision maker that I think could play up with their main guys because of the things that he adds. It's just I feel like the li- the types of lineups that he's going to work with are going to be a little more squeezed because, you know, Giannis is a non-shooter, a hypothetical shooter. Drew can be erratic, you know, like you were talking about Brooke being erratic. It just seems like the lineup, it's going to be tough for him to make a fit there. Yeah, I mean, look, I was hoping he landed on a team like Denver. Um, you know, it would have been a dream. <laughs> Instead, Denver took the guys that they did, Strother, Tyson, you know, Pickett. We talked about how, how you know, Pickett's an ideal fit there. I think Tyson is a very good fit, too. And Strother, having them behind Michael Porter Jr. as, you know, potential replacements if MPG's out injured or becomes the guy that they have to trade when their salaries become so inflated. Um, I like what they did on draft night. So let's talk about now some, some good fits. Uh, I want to talk about uh, what the Spurs did. Aside from Victor Wembanyama, I really like the City Sissoko pick. Um, them picking, them getting him in the second round. I've kind of, I've played around with him in the in the late teens and the early thirties. You know, in my big board, he ended up landing on the back end of that uh, late twenties, low thirties. But for the Spurs, he's the type of guy that I'd rank him higher if I knew that he would land with San Antonio. I just think his type of skill set. Um, the passing ability with his size. I mean, some of the full court, you know, off the dribble passes he had this season, the the interior, re- you know, feeds. I, I think it's just going to be a dream fit for him, you know, in the same way that Jeremy Sohan is with Victor Wembanyama. Now you get two guys who have size at the wing position that can play the four or play the three, and they bring, you know, connective playmaking. It just is going to, you know, work perfectly in San Antonio. And then they also. 
an undrafted free agency, got Charles Bediaco out of Alabama. Their yeah. big, beefy center. Um, you know, I, I think having him with Victor Wembenyama, I thought he should have been drafted. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see uh, like those guys together in summer league if they do play one at least one game together. How those guys interact because Betty Ako, you know, that, that, that dude's tough. That's exactly the type of center that I'd want in a lineup next to Wimby, especially earlier in his career. So I, I, I love what the Spurs came away with, even putting aside the fact they got a generational prospect of Victor Wimby. We'll just sit that to the side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I like the size and the length ad. Yeah. Betty Ako is, is, he's, Huge guy, long arms, really aggressive rim protector. Like we said, he's he's a long work in progress, but you've got you've got a yes. face up big uh, with Wimby. I wanted to shout another uh, fit that I think is interesting. This is an under the radar fit thing with the Bucks. Actually, was Jazion Gortman? I think was a nice talent flyer for mm. them to take uh, with OTE, a kid who was a OTE, highly yep. rated. You're yeah. talking about betting on talent. You get him, you know, he's 6'2". He's going to be 20 years old, but he's very, very athletic. His shot mechanics are not busted at all. Like, he's, he is like the, he is sort of a, uh, uh, not to use their word hypothetical again. Like, his his starting point, I think, is not as, it's promising, I would say. And I, I was just going to add in there that I think him next to those vets, I think, is an interesting thing. I just wanted to say that before we move on to the next one. That was another one that I liked. Um, in terms of, uh, did, did you want to do some more good fits or bad fits? I had yeah, some whoever bad you got. fits. Good fits, bad fits, whatever you want. <laughs> I don't know if this is bad um, so much as it's the same kind of thing with Reddish. Like, Leonard Miller, I understand the thinking here. I just wonder for his particular developmental path, how much time he's going to get. It kind of makes you wonder if he's going to be spending a lot of time in the G League this year. Similar to, to our guy James Najee, I feel like he's going to be with the Greensboro Swarm a whole lot just because they have a lot of length upside plays with like JT Thor and... Kai Jones and, you know, Mark Williams and Nick Richards. Um, but Leonard, Leonard Miller, if you think about it, you got Torian Prince, you've got Jaden, obviously, you got Slow Mo. I guess maybe they're thinking of him as maybe filling that Vando kind of role, hypothetically. I just wonder if a team, if they're a team that's trying to win now, how much do you think we see Leonard Miller in the near future? Is there going to be enough space for him? Because he's pretty raw still, you know, he's come a long way. That one, that one I thought was intriguing. I'm just like, I'm not sure about that. Well, they just re-signed Nas Reed. You know, Verno and I talked in the mismatch about what does that mean for Carl Anthony Towns? You know, that that's exactly where I turn. What does what does re-signing Nas Reed for $42 million over three years, what does drafting Leonard Miller and Jalen Clark for that matter, too? You know, I, I know, you know, Jalen Clark gets hurt at the end of that last season for UCLA, but, you know, you have Tim Conley talking in his press conference about how he thinks he was the best perimeter player in the draft. Best perimeter defender. You know, oh, I was he's say, only, did he say player? Wow. Okay. Per, per, perimeter defender. He, I yeah, mean, granted, yeah. he's only six foot four, but you know, he's six six nine wingspan. He's long. He can play against bigger guys. Um, you know, I, I just think kind of their selections, kind of, in my opinion, point towards. Oh, we want to play. You know, with one true five, and then have a bunch of wings, big, long, versatile guys alongside that player. You know, when you draft Jalen Clark and you've got McDaniels on your roster and you draft Leonard Miller, I, I, that's where it feels like it's pointing to me. And I don't know where Carl Anthony Towns fits into that equation. Uh, and Unless they want to run it back for one more year and see how it goes with a full training camp and all that. I'm glad they realized that they want to play that way, Kevin, a year later. What a great, you know, they really tiptoed and just sort of eased their way into that with the choices that they made. Makes a ton <laughs> of sense. I was going to throw a uh, a potential trade at you. Please. I've been trying to figure out where where Cat might go. I was going to say Awoma too as an exhibit ten for De- Detroit. That's another good one. Um, just I just like him, Toolsy. Uh, do you think that Cat could be a potential candidate for Detroit to to land in Detroit? And do you like that fit? Um, I mean, Detroit's one team I haven't thought about. Um, of all the teams, like what what are they giving up? Tell me, what's the trade? Let's say the Timberwolves trade. I actually think this helps both sides. So the Pistons send Bojan, uh, a 2026 second rounder, and James Wiseman to the Timberwolves for Carl Anthony Towns. Is that enough? They need more picks to pull that off? I want more from Minnesota. 
I'm not giving up Cad. He's 27. Granted, he's not the best fit. And yes, he's going to be paid. You literally a ton of just money. said you want to get rid of him. What do you mean I'm yeah, not giving no, up Cad? Sure. Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not giving up. Uh, giving him up for James Wiseman <laughs> and Bojan Bogdanovic, who helps yeah, he's them immediately. 35 years old. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I just like the. Sh- I think I just like the shooting. I think give what, me what, more what, picks, buddy. Come on. Okay. <laughs> I uh, okay. Okay. See, I'm a terrible negotiator. I folded that quickly. Uh, no, I mean, I just think when I was looking at their core, I want Killian. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Your your judgment is compromised in this deal, Kev. Uh, no, I was I was looking at their their core like we were talking about earlier, and I was just like, man, it'd be amazing if you could get like a ball skill five in the, with that group. Yeah, and that he was somebody that came to mind. But I mean, that's that's. But do really you run if you're Detroit though, Kyle? Do you, do you do you run into the same issues if you're Detroit though, or like that Minnesota has, where you get Jalen Duran, who's a you know lob guy, a rim protector, and all that. Do you run into the same issues with Duran Towns that Minnesota has with Gobert and Towns together? I don't think so. I, I think that, like, well, Gobert is so much more, like, drop-specific. I know he can come out, but he's more he's more of a park him in the paint kind of a big, like, two-point dining, as, as they say. He can Durant switch. can float a little bit, yeah. And, and float and be a dunker spot on offense, be sort of a supportive weak side fly in from the rafter shot blocker type guy. It doesn't feel the exact same to me. I don't that's kind of where my mind was going. There's not many of those ball skill fives out there. I mean like Miles Turner, Brooke, you know, Brooke mm-hmm. Lopez. They, there's just not a ton of them out there. I, I like the idea of pairing Duran with with a guy like that though. Uh, that was that was the goal there. I do look forward to seeing where Cat ends up going, you know, if he gets traded. I think with him, you know, he he's there's still something there, maybe in the right situation where things can work out for him. Um but I don't know. He he's he's a strange fit. He he is. A- any other uh, good fits, bad fits that you want to unleash, Kyle? Um, I was gonna say this is a this is a big one at the top, but I, there's so much shaking out with this. It's just that like the 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 Scoot Shaden Simons. I mean, the even even if you take the Dame part of it out, I just think them taking him creates sort of implied things coming in the future. Just because the three of them together would be very fun. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of times trying to, tr- time trying to trade, uh, Anthony Simons to the Raptors. Cause I think that would be an amazing fit. And I think, you know, it would just give them a, a movement shooter, a guy who can go on and off ball. That would make sense to me, but I don't know. I, I, I just think that that's probably, but I don't think that that's like a bad fit. I think it just implies decisions that need to be made. And that's kind of the theme of the, of the fit stuff that I've come up with here in this exercise, honestly. What do you think about the other picks Portland made? They got Chris Murray with the 23rd pick, uh, like Ryan Rupert with the 43rd pick. I like both of them. Um, I mean, they're a team that's kind of starting over. I, th- I think you just make talent grabs. I think Rupert is, is a nice perimeter, good size. You know, I, th- I, I feel good about him. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, Chris Murray, we've talked about him all year. He's a guy that doesn't need the ball to be impactful. You know, they're going to have a lot of ball-dominant guys on that team. Yeah, I think, I think he's a good value where they got him, you know. Well, Kyle? Next week, it'll be a couple days uh, from Vegas Summer League. We'll be in the middle of the California Classic Summer League. And we'll be talking about that sometime next week uh, when we record. And I'll see you in Vegas, Kyle, late next week. Next week. I'm looking coming up to fast, man. I can't believe mm-hmm. we're already here. I kind of, I was telling Megan over breakfast, I was like, I, you, you have, you get in that NBA cycle where you're just like, okay, there's, there's always something to watch, <laughs> you know? And I was just like, oh, there's no games, nothing. To, there's no draft. There's, it's, so we're in that lull right before free agency where it's, it's not as much, you know, viewing driven. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of, I don't know, Kevin, what do you do with yourself this time of year? I guess you're moving right on, writing about the free agency destinations. Kevin O'Connor never stops. He never takes a break, folks. He's just nonstop all year long. Yeah, it's free agency look-aheads and uh, drafts, you know, aftermath stuff right now. And then, um, yeah, I mean, mid-July, though, will be here soon. And that's kind of the dead time in the NBA. And that's where, you know, maybe there's still some lingering stuff, you know, some trades that hang on until then. But seems like we're moving into a direction where things will be done by the middle of the July. Um, but I look forward to summer league. I, I think this year will be fun. Uh, and mostly, I mean, obviously I look forward to seeing Wemben Yama, uh, you know, Miller and Scoot and all those guys, but um, it, it'll be, it'll be nice to see you and the ringer people. It seems like we're going to have a pretty big Always. crew out there in Vegas this year. So rolling deep. Where do you think that Wimby's arena entrance is going to rank in terms of the electricity? Let's think, let's oh, think yeah. of the big ones. 
I mean, Lonzo took it to another level. I know that sounds Lakers funny now, fans. But it was filled with Lakers fans. It was insane. Uh, yep. Zion. Zion. What's the other one? I mean, I think it'll surpass Zion. I do. Well, we ha- we have a Spurs uh, a Spurs Blazers on the schedule, don't we? I'm pretty sure we have one. Like That's you know, Sunday. last year, I guess I'm not, I'm not. Yeah. So, but Friday night is Brandon Miller, Victor Wembanyama. And then Sunday would be Scoot versus Wemby, but I'm not sure Wemby's going to play both. I think he'll play at least one. I'd be I'd be shocked if it's not Friday night. Friday night just makes so much sense. The league is promoting it. You know, tickets are selling like hotcakes right now. I don't know. I, I'd be shocked if he doesn't play Friday night. It'd be a major, major bummer if he doesn't. Yeah, it's going to be. He, he's just wired differently, man. Like, I wouldn't be surprised mm-hmm. if it, they have to, like, tell forcibly stop him from playing. Like, he just yeah. he has that type of personality, which I love. Um, I don't know. I was trying to look down through the list here of Tate and I were kind of talking about, like, who might lead the summer league in scoring. We both kind of predicted that Ricky Council might put up buckets because the Sixers team is not going to be draft pick heavy and they're just going to be, like, letting it fly. I'm trying to think if there's another guy here that makes sense. A Thompson twin, perhaps? Maybe. Maybe. Um, that that could Pajipsky? happen. I'm, I really like that. I, I got te- somebody was teasing me saying we always like the Warriors picks. I was like, I've been kind of like making fun of them relentlessly for their picks lately. I, I like the Pajimsky, Pajimsky uh, Trace Jackson Davis fits there. I think those both of those yeah. make a lot of sense. I love both of them. He just he has sort of a schoolyard kind of game like Pajemski does. He has that kind of free floating kind of like he just has a loose kind of fluid game that I think could be fun at summer league. Um, I don't know. Hit us up if you think there's if there's a dark horse pick for that for who could uh, who could lead the lead, the summer league in scoring. But yeah. Well, Kyle, I look forward to talking to you next week, man. You too, buddy. Good to see you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Ringers NBA Draft Show. Thank you to Jesse Lopez for producing it. We will talk to you in a week.